Farewell Shiraz by Cyrus Kadavar There are times when I dream of Shiraz. It happens whenever it rains in London, Paris, or any other city I may be in. How can I forget the city where cypresses stand tall, straight and dense against a blue, cloudless sky, where the roses, splendid and fragrant, are serenaded by the nightingales? Then I remember him. As a child I was entirely under his spell. Every morning, after performing his ablutions, uttering his Muslim prayers and shaving, my paternal grandfather would ask me to sit beside him on the Qashqai rug and choose a book from the pile on the floor. Excited, I would rummage through his collection, discarding each and every volume, except for one superbly bound illustrated copy of the Shahnameh, the epic Book of Kings. Containing 60,000 verses and written a thousand years ago, by the immortal Iranian poet Ferdowsi, this masterpiece had taken 30 years to compose. Every line was meant to evoke national pride in Iran's past glories before the Arab conquest of Persia. As I opened the book, my young eyes would devour the miniature pictures. Here and there I would spot a king or a prince seated on a magnificent horse. There were queens and princesses in silk robes and jewels. On another page a brave warrior battled with a horned monster. Elsewhere, I marveled at doomed lovers drinking wine from cups of gold, carousing their rose-filled garden under the silver moon and a flowing stream. Still, in his white cotton pyjamas, Mohammed Kadivar would put on his thick glasses and take me on a magical literary adventure. Mesmerized by my grandfather's voice, which was husky with the pathos and power of the verses he recited, I would listen intently as he recounted the mythical tales and rattled off the names of the proud and good king Jamshid, and Zahak, the evil prince who banished him, the daring blacksmith Carvet and his battle to save Persia from dark forces. I heard the names of the colossal warrior Rostam and his son Sohrab. There was also a phoenix-like bird called Seymour who could carry a camel or an elephant on his giant wings. My grandfather always spoke in Farsi, so that his grandson, a Persian-French boy from Minneapolis, would one day understand the meaning of being an Iranian. Barely four years old, I was instantly drawn to all those vivid images. The Persian word for grandfather is Baba Bozorg. But from the very beginning, the middle-aged man reading to me was called Papi Kuchik. It would be years before I understood and absorbed the rich heritage of my country. There were other books too, with roses and nightingales painted on their covers honoring the eternal poets. Typical of his generation, my grandfather was a devotee of the Shirazi bards, Hafez and Saadi, treasured for their celebration of earthly pleasures. He could quote abundant verses by heart. To impress his wife, he would scribble one of his latest poems on paper, folding it carefully before asking me, to deliver it to my unsuspecting grandmother at breakfast time when the family sat down at the table on the veranda. An Iranian breakfast, or sobhane as my grandmother called it, was a simple affair. Warm flatbread, butter, quince jam, honey, walnuts, feta cheese, mint leaves and tea. My grandfather always sipped his black tea in a tiny glass with a lump of sugar between his teeth, and I tried to imitate him. Then he would wink at me. That, I knew, was a signal to pass the note to my grandmother. Tugging gently at her dress, I would sheepishly hand her the secret message. Mami Kuchik would blush. Shaking her head in mock exasperation, she would roll her eyes and declare, God save us, when will this old man act his age? Suppressing a giggle, she would put away the love poem in her purse. Strange that I never saw my grandparents kiss. Instead, Mami Kuchik would hand me a pink rose she had cut from our small garden, or write a few humorous lines for her husband and whisper, Go give this to Arajun. Papi Kuchik would read the note and crack up laughing, and reward me with a sticky pistachio nougat he kept in his breast pocket. These loving exchanges often masked the sadness and regret my grandparents had for having left Shiraz so many years ago. As residents of modern Tehran, a rapidly growing metropolis 
laden with a vast population, heavy traffic and smog. They appreciated Shiraz for her perfect climate, high elevation, invigorating air, dazzling sun, and cool night breezes for the purple-tinted Zagros mountains rimming the city. Nobody really disagreed with them. That summer of 1966, my Iranian grandparents had come to Shiraz to help my 36-year-old father, a Western-trained surgeon, and his French wife, and two sons, to settle down in their rented house. Mami Kuchik, an olive-skinned woman with a penetrating stare and wrinkled face, had volunteered to initiate my mother into Persian life and was unable to separate herself from my baby brother. My grandfather often took me out on his daily morning walk. Holding his hand, I would step out of the two-story house located on Behbahani Street and head down with my grandfather to Ferdosi Street. On the leafy Rudaki Street, we would stroll beneath the trees, relishing the quiet neighborhood and the old, graceful buildings. There was a kiosk on a street corner where Papi Kuchik often stopped for a few minutes to glance at the newspaper headlines. Usually, if I behaved, Papi Kuchik would treat me to a follow day ice cream or buy me chewing gum from one of the street urchins. On the shaded sidewalk along the lengthy Zand Boulevard, we admired the boutiques and arcades, modern hotels, bookshops, cafes, and movie theaters with names like Capri and Persepolis. Once we took a taxi to the zoo and watched the caged peacocks, monkeys, and a sleepy lion. There was also a circus performer dressed as a Persian Hercules in a leopard skin outfit who impressed children and their parents by bending iron bars. Further down on a hill, commanding an entrancing view of the city, was a splendid garden housing the renovated tomb of the poet Hafez. My grandfather enjoyed bringing me here, where birdsong and the hum of insects filled my senses. The dust and scent of roses tickled my nose. More like a pleasure park than a burial ground, this well-kept garden attracted people of all ages. They came to recite sonnets, sing and drink, dancing to the sound of music. In the Hafezier, we would cool down in the shade of an open-air dome held up by eight columns. My grandfather would open a small book of Hafez's poems and murmur a few lines while one hand caressed the marble tombstone of that great wise man who lay below. I did not know at the time that the name Hafez means he who has memorized the Quran by heart. Born in 1320, Hafez wrote 500 verses in his lifetime. Twice he was chased out of Shiraz by the Muslim orthodoxy for being a corrupting influence on the youth. Long after his death in 1388, he remained a worldly and enduring symbol of love and free thinking. Behind the poet's resting place was an orange grove and a well-kept cemetery. After offering prayers for the souls of the forty mystics, scholars and other notables of Shiraz who lay buried in the sacred ground, Papi Kuchik would take me to another spectacular garden. The locals and tourists who came to this place liked to pose for pictures in front of the Saadi Mausoleum, a white octagonal structure designed by the French architect André Godard. The tombstone of this humanist poet was of polished marble and embellished by Iranian artisans with famous verses. There was also a rectangular pool where, on my first visit, I threw a real coin at the fish, wishing that my grandfather would live forever. On the way back, we stopped at a bakery to buy our oven-baked bread with names like Barbary, Sangak, Taftun, and Lavash, samples hanging from nails. From there, we went to the popular Rudaki market where Papi Kuchik selected the best fruits and vegetables from the stalls before we hurried back home to avoid the invading heat. At noon, the family gathered upstairs in the dining room and tucked into a Persian feast prepared in our dark kitchen by Rokhaye, a cheerful young woman my grandmother had brought with her from Tehran. In a muted atmosphere, we filled our bellies with saffron rice, kebabs, and delicious stews such as fesenjan, bademjan, and khoreshte qorme sabzi. There were bowls of yogurt seasoned with garlic, raisins, and shredded cucumbers. I loved the crispy tadig rice, scraped from the bottom of the pot. In the heat of the summer, we quenched our thirst and washed down our food with ice-cold water poured from glass pitchers. 
Later, while Rogaya cleared the dishes, everyone disappeared into their rooms for their afternoon siestas. Unable to do the same, my mother would find a corner in the house to peruse her magazines or write long letters to her parents in Paris describing her experiences. In the late afternoons, when the sun's rays gently faded away, the entire household would migrate to the courtyard next to a patch of lawn and a sad-looking rose bush. Roya would serve us tea in tiny silver estacons, while I leaned happily on a square cushion with my grandfather, who would hand me an apricot or peel me a large juicy orange with his pocket knife. Other times we enjoyed slices of watermelon and sipped refreshing sharbat drinks made of crushed ice and syrup. We usually sat on garden chairs and reclined on wooden benches covered with tribal kalims. My grandfather loved telling stories. He constantly enthralled us by sharing memories of a way of life that no longer existed. Mamie Kuchik would dry her tears with the corner of her white chador. Other times she produced old photographs from her handbag. I would stare at them fascinated and blissfully unaware of their significance, even if I realized that they evoked a different age. I thrived on such moments when everyone around me conversed in Persian, French and English. Like all families, we had our own folklore, repeated and embellished until it became part of the tapestry of our lives. There was a point in each day when my grandfather realized that his grandson needed more than books to keep him from getting bored. On such occasions, we went for our daily walks. One morning, Papi Kuchik took me to a toy shop on Rudak Street and bought me a plastic gun for my fourth birthday. Later, we stopped for some carrot juice to refresh us before continuing to Zand Boulevard. All along the main archway of the city, flags tied to trees and lampposts fluttered in the autumn breeze. On that sunny day, Shiraz was abuzz. Officers in smart brown uniforms, policemen, and elite soldiers in helmets with rifles and fixed bayonets formed a wall between the large cheering crowd and the main street decorated in triumphal flower arches. What's going on? my grandfather asked the young man beside him. It's the Shah, he cried out excitedly. Lifting me to his shoulders, my grandfather pointed to the king as his motorcade swept by. Standing in an open silver-blue car, the king was a distant figure in a dark suit and prematurely white hair. He smiled and waved. People shouted, Javid Shah! Long live the king! Then, in a flash, the Shah and his motorcycle escort were gone. That was the one and only time I ever saw Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi up close. Despite the excitement around us, Papi Kuchik, beaming expression has suddenly turned sour. He looked terrified. Waving a gun, even a cheap plastic one, at the mighty ruler of my country was a serious offence. The previous year, the Shah had survived another attempt on his life, this time at Sadabad Palace, when a soldier of the Imperial Guard had opened fire on the monarch as he went to his office. The would-be assassin and two royal bodyguards lost their lives in the shootout but the king escaped, unscathed. Not surprisingly, on that day, in Shiraz, my toy gun caught the attention of two security men. They came running toward my grandfather in their dark suits and sunglasses. There were some sharp exchanges. One of the agents asked to see the gun, which my grandfather had taken from me and hidden in his pocket. Sur surrendering the pistol diffused the situation. The fake weapon was returned to my grandfather with a curt apology. Wiping the sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief, my grandfather took me home. Hearing the story, Mami Kuchik berated her husband for buying me the toy. Couldn't you have bought something else? she shouted. Father cooled matters down with his usual tact. He was worried about my grandfather's health. He rolled up Papi Kuchik's sleeves and took his blood pressure, which was very high. There, there, you need to rest, father told him, putting away his stethoscope. That day I hugged my grandfather, telling him how much I loved him, and waited for him to get better. <laughs>